So we continue now with the last two presentations. The first one is from uh, Armin Lorenz and after that Jenny Munt. Armin is uh, working with the University of Duisburg Essen. He's uh, also involved in the reform project, not as a work package leader, but as an uh, indirect person involved in the reform project. He studied biology and uh, especially he uh, once had made a thesis on the invertebrate community of a temporary stream in 2000. He's a senior, a senior scientist and uh, involved in several EU-funded projects. So please, Armin, on you the floor. <coughs> um, yeah. This is the pointer. pointer. Yes, it was forward and backwards. Hmm? Yeah, okay. <coughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. Mm, can this go up somehow? Okay, um, first of all, I would like to apologize for, I think, two or three things. First of all, I won't talk much about reform. Although I'm involved in reform, but um, as I saw the title of my, my, uh, my talk, it was Effects of Restoration Measures and the Influence of Catchment Pressures. Uh, if I would talk about reform, then it would be potential effects and potential pressures. So I thought I would try to talk about something what we really um, analyzed up to, up to date and not what we will do now in, in the reform project. Because in the reform project, it will be a more in-depth analysis and I'm involved in the working group in, in reform and we are still working on it. We did a large and extensive <coughs> um, field survey, but we don't have the real data yet. So I tried now to explain you something more in, in, in detail what we did so far in, in Germany. Um, the, second, uh, the second apology is because uh, this morning I heard this looks like Herr Tippis Niederlande fingert hier. But uh, I broke my finger two days ago, so <laughs> I, I don't want to point on something terrible in restoration measures or whatsoever. I will use my left hand, not the right hand, pointing on something ugly. Okay, so. Okay, effects of restoration measures and influence of catchment pressures. Um, probably you all know these kinds of rivers. It looks like a ditch or canal, but it's actually a river in Germany. But probably you all know them. They are fixed, you have a straight, straight line, fixed banks, normally grassland with some cows on it. And if you're lucky, then sometimes there are some trees on one side. These sites could be restored and can be restored in, in different ways. First way could be you use heavy machinery, widen the river bottom, really get other, other kind of material into it or at least uh, create some kind of habitat. The other way could be like this. You just stop maintenance of the river so the, the banks evolve in time to something more natural. Another possibility could be that you just put in large, large wood, large logs, which is done now more and more in, in Germany and in many restoration measures. If you do these kind of measures, then a river could look like this or you don't see a river, I know. But there is a river, normal, normally in Germany there is a road beside a river, so if you see here a river, it goes down there, and if it's restored it looks like this. So now the actual pattern appears again, and you see they build a new river system or a new, new river itself, a new plan form, they created a secondary floodplain for the river itself. So there could be large measures like this one on several kilometers or smaller measures. Um, <clears throat> in mountain, mountainous areas, river sections or restoration measures in Germany, if they are bigger measures, they look like this. Just remember the footpath here and the straightened bank here. After the measure, looks like this is the same tree, so they just widened the whole river, the river floor. 
and gave the, gave the river more, more potential to create its own substrate or uh, its own habitats. Another possibility would be this river, which I showed you in the beginning, of course, with the cows on the one side, a few hundred meters below, uh, uh, below this side, it looks like this. They restored the river, they created shallow banks. You see now macrophytes in it. You see dead wood there, which is placed there. And a succession of the, of the floodplain vegetation coming up in the whole area. In particular, sh shallow banks, so we have more and other kind of habitats. So the, the, the German practice in restoration measures is mainly a physical kind of restoration. So we have river stretches normally reaching between 100 and in extraordinary sites, two kilometers length. But they, we have different kind of restoration measures. Small ones, large ones, whatsoever, only doing something on one side of the river or just creating a new river course. So there are different kind of measures, but they are all based on the EU Water Framework Directive. So the, the real target actually is ec ecological status. And what our intention was, what is the air effect of these restoration measures on different stream biota in Germany? And what is the effect of the land use practices upstream on these sites or on the stream biota in these sites? And what is the effect of the physical river habitat quality upstream? So we wanted to know, does the upstream area has an effect on the biota in the restored site, or is it only the site itself which has an effect for the ecological status in the end? And in the end, has the whole catchment upstream, which could be, for example, in the ISO here, most of the catchment is probably in Germany. Has this one, for example, an effect if there is a restoration measure down here in Südfen? So we wanted to know, is there an effect of the whole catchment or on smaller sections on the biota in, in restored sections. F um, to follow these purposes, we did an analysis, or we, we analyzed 40, more than 40 restoration measures in Germany. Here on this side is the Netherlands, so you see some of the sites in the lowlands of Germany, some in mountainous areas here. <coughs> the sites were between 300 and 2.5 kilometers long, and as I said, streams and rivers and lowland and mountainous areas. In our first comparison, we compared a degraded site upstream, so a few hundred meters upstream, to the restored site itself. And we wanted to know how does the morphology change, how does fish, benthic invertebrates, and macrophytes change, and what were the effects on riparian beetles and floodplain vegetation. So the idea was, is there a difference between the organisms groups which colonize the real aquatic part to the organism groups which live in the, in the real floodplain area. So is there a difference in effect by the restoration measure on these different kind of, of, organ, of organism groups? We used um, the methods which are uh, compliant to the Water Framework Directive, so the methods which have to be applied in Germany. We analyzed the change or response of the different organism groups and analyzed the, the, the change in, in species richness, for example, abundance and so on, and many assessment purposes and wanted to see what are the differences there. I only will show, will show you some of the results, just a small spotlight on what we found out there. You will see it as, as box plots, so always we put together the degraded ones and compared them to the, de to the restored sites. So first of all, morphology. We analyzed the sites on a 200 meter length in 10 transects and just counted the number of different habitats we found there. Is there a secondary channel or a third channel? Are there banks? Are there sidebars? Are there islands present in all these sites? And just wanted to know what is the number of habitats we found out there in the floodplain? And of course, <clears throat> you know it always, when you go out into the field, into the restored site, normally you see directly the difference. But we wanted to have clear numbers afterwards to correlate them also for other analysis with the biota. So of course we see a, diff a change as a much higher number of habitats in the restored sites compared to the degraded sites in the floodplain. Then if we want to look into the water itself, the aquatic part, the microhabitats, so is there sand, is there gravel, are there cobbles present? Is there a POM or other, is there dead wood present? 
we did the same analysis on these trend on these 10 transacts and we found out it's not much change it's not much of a difference in the aquatic habitat a higher difference is in the in the floodplain itself then we compared the species numbers of the different sites and here you see the results for macrophytes invertebrates and fish and we see here directly there is a change in macrophytes we have a doubling of number of macrophyte species present in the restored sites in invertebrates there is no change at all or no difference or at least no significant difference we have a significant difference in the fish it is significant but it's about 12 species or 13 species compared to 11 species in, me, um, in medium so it's not much of a difference so the boxes of both both groups nearly overlap. But if we want to see again on the two groups from the um, floodplain, then we see clear changes in between. We have a doubling of number of, of vegetation of plant species in the restored sites compared to the degraded ones, and the double number of riparian uh, beetles. So there's a high effect on the riparian fauna and, and flora, not so much an effect on the aquatic area. If we also look into the assessment system itself, so the really important thing for water managers, how does the ecological status change? Is there a change or not? Then we found out we, did, we saw a clear difference in the macrophytes, so it is an improvement there. It is significant. We saw no significant differences between in the macroinvertebrates. We saw a difference in the fish. Again, there is an improvement there. Not much, but it is an improvement. For the uh, floodplain organism groups, there is no system at all yet established, at least not in Germany, I think in all the other countries also not, because it's not yet really established in the Water Framework Directive. So what we think, the effect of restoration measures is mainly on floodplain vegetation and on riparian beetles. So we found out a much higher effect also in other kind of metrics, let's say abundance, quantity, and so on. And Bigger effect on macrophytes than on fish, and on macroinvertebrates, we nearly didn't see any effect, at least no significant one in, in the data set which we analyzed. We can interpret it as this, for example, this is, we have large effects on the floodplain habitats, that's what we found out in the beginning, and these groups really reacted much stronger on the restoration measures than the ones in the aquatic uh, environment so smaller effects on the aquatic habitats there was also not a big change in aquatic niche the question behind is so what is what is the, yeah what is the cause for it could be mainly also because of historic water pollution because of depletion of all the species present in the system and they don't come back or didn't come back so fast and easy because the recolonization potential of these species is also like this we have the seed bank for all these uh, these plants there. There's a big seed bank and if you do a large restoration measure you put off all the, the, the ground, the, the upper, upper ground, then the seed bank comes up and all the species come back. These beetles here can fly very very good and directly and easy can colonize for example new established sand and gravel bars. It is very, very underestimated the dispersal ability of macrophytes by, by birds and so on. So they can also disperse relatively good. Fish and, and macroinvertebrates really have a problem with all those weirs and they can travel. Some of the invertebrates can fly, I know, but the flying ability is also not very long and not very far. So I think there is also a big problem in recolonization potential and this is also seen here in, in, in the effects of restoration measures. But let's come back to the assessment system, which is the real main purpose of, of water managers, at least in Germany. If we see the numbers here and the differences, of course we saw no difference in invertebrates, some difference in, in, in fish and in, in, in macrophytes. But the important thing is the change or if the sites reach a good ecological status. And this is the border normally in the assessment systems. For invertebrates is 0.6, so here is reference status, there is worse status. And we see here, it's not much of the sites really reach good status, and even the degraded ones had good status in some parts. Some of the uh, macrophytes 
sites reach good status, but only some. The same is true for fish. Although the river habitat um, itself, so the, the river habitat survey showed that it, it increased a lot. So the niches were there, but the species didn't come back really. So in about only one third, one fourth of all the restoration measures which we evaluated, um, there was good, good status established, at least for some of the sites. That's why we wanted to know, is there an effect besides this local effect from the upstream area? So could it be the upstream area which rules the outcome of a restoration measure? So that's why we analyze now land use practices, river habitat survey or physical habitat quality, and the land use in the, in the full catchment upstream. Sorry. <coughs> For this analysis, we did a buffer, buffer analysis in, an, in a GIS system. We have our restored site here. The river comes from here. And we analyzed the river on a, on a, a certain length and two different buffer width to see what is the land use and what is the river habitat survey or river habitat quality in the length of 500 meters, 1,000, 2.5 kilometers, 5 kilometers, and 10 kilometers upstream of the restored site. In Germany, all, all rivers, or let's say 80% of all rivers, is, there is a river habitat survey already present. So there, the results are there from the, from the river habitat quality. Um, and of course, we use the land use uh, data from the whole catchment. Um, to come to some of the results, to show you some of the uh, results, we just correlated these results of the river habitat survey and of the land use practices with the results of or the EQR, so with the result of the assessment systems, and just try to look if there is some kind of correlation in between. We found out that for invertebrates there is a correlation or a significant correlation for up to 5,000 meters upstream of the river, river habitat quality on the EQR of the, of the macroinvertebrates. So there is an effect up to 5,000 5, meters. So what is the quality upstream really has an effect. So if it's good, it has, the EQR is better. Or if it's bad, then the EQR is, is, is bad on the restored side. We did the same analysis for the fish. And we found out there is a significant correlation up to 10,000 meters upstream. So really, 10,000 meters upstream has an effect on a restored side. For macrophyte, it was again 5,000 meters. It just shows us that there is a correlation, so there is a connectivity between it. So we have positive and negative effects for the EQR, so for the communities of the site, depending on the morphological status upstream. So it could be bad or good, both ways. But we didn't find any significant correlation with the morphological status of the site itself. So how, how you restored it wasn't that important as the upstream area. Then we did, some, did the analysis on the different land use forms. And we found significant correlations for percentage of deciduous forest for 500 and for 1,000 meters on the macro, macro invertebrates, not more, and for fish. The significant correlation started at 5,000 meters on the small and the big wide buffer and goes up to 10,000 meters. That means that near natural land use upstream and a buffer beside the rivers or the sites causes positive effects on the communities in the restored sites. But in fish, only the real long stretches. So it's not 500 meters or 1,000 meters which has an effect or the, the land use form forest has an effect. It needs to be longer stretches, which really causes effects on the restored sites. <coughs> then the analysis or the results for the, the whole catchment upstream, again for invertebrates, and we didn't find any significant re uh, correlation. So this is very important because now you can say, if you want to do something here in the Rhine, you can't say, oh, it's <coughs> there is no 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 possibility at all because all the upper system is a problem. It's not the way. The, way. the next few hundred, few kilometers are the important way. Not the whole catchment is important. For 
fish, we found some kind of correlation, not high, but with coniferous forest in the, in the whole catchment for macrophytes. Again, we didn't find any correlation for the whole, from the whole catchment on the EQR of the site. <coughs> So to sum that up and, and figure it out a little bit more and, and kind of a picture, um, when we take the German River Habitat Survey results, we find really important effects on the biota for the five kilometers upstream for macrophytes and, and, and invertebrates, for 10 kilometers for fish. Deciduous forest has important effects for macro, macro invertebrates for one kilometer upstream of restored sites and about <laughs> five and 10 kilometers for fish. And for fish, the whole catchment, if there is forest or not, is important to get a good result there. But to come back to, to our original question and seeing that only one, one quarter of the sites has, has a good status, we wanted to jump on the horse from the other side. I think that's the meaning from in German. I don't know the Dutch or English thing. <laughs> We just took these, these nine sites here and wanted to know, is it right? We only found now significant correlation, but we didn't know what is significant. How much do we need? How much forest do we need? Or how good should, should a, a river habitat survey be? Should, the, should it be reference condition or could it be good status to, to at least only good status? So we compared these ones. So the, the good sites, the sites which had a good or and, and reference condition, compared them to the sites, to the uh, restored sites which only gained um, moderate, poor, or bad status. And so you see here these two ecological quality class, the green ones, oh, that was too fast. The green ones are the ones which uh, get ecological quality, quality class one and two, and the red ones, three, four, and five, so moderate, poor, and bad. And you see directly, the difference for the fish sites of the fish, the sites improved, oh, this is reference, one would be reference status, seven would be totally impaired in the German score, scoring system. So the restored sites in the end reached a medium number of about three. So it, they, they didn't get reached reference status in terms of morphology, but at least they are big, they are, uh, got a much bigger or uh, better score than all the other sites around, which you can see from, from these sites here. But this is a 500 meter upstream, upstream score. And you see the sites which gained, which were good or better, had a medium score of 4.5, which is always better than the sites which were poor, bad, uh, moderate, poor, and bad. So we see a clear difference from the sites which get a good good result in the end in the restored sites. If we do the same analysis for the invertebrates, again, we have the same thing. The restored sites are, are in relatively good status. We get better scores for the sites which reach a, reach a good status than the ones which reach a poor, uh, poor, moderate, and bad. And this goes up to 2,000 or nearly 5,000 meters upstream. For the macrophytes, we have the difference only up to 1,000 or 2,500 meters. Then we did the same thing with deciduous forests, so the other parameter, which was very important, or seemed to be very important. And again, we see here a clear difference for the fish, the sites which had good status. They all had about, for the next 10,000 meters upstream, they had about 20% or even more deciduous forest, uh, only in the buffer strip. And they were all better than all the other sites. For the invertebrates, again, they had also about 20% of deciduous forest upstream, up to 5,000 meters. For macrophytes, it's the other way around. Probably there is a, the good sites have less forest directly upstream, which is probably the way there's less shading, so the macrophytes grow better. Yeah. And if we do the same analysis with cropland, so arable land, corn growing whatsoever in, directly in the buffer strip. Again, we see direct difference in, for fish. We have very low percentage of cropland in the buffer sections for the good sites, up to 10,000 meter. And it's, it's all significant up to here, to 5,000 meter. We have no real difference in macroinvertebrates. 
And we, again, we have a difference for, for the macrophytes, so there's high high percentage of propylene, which is again only probably the possibility of less shading and a little bit more, a little bit more of nutrients, which cause it a, becoming a better um, macrophyte community. <laughs> So in the end, for us, it means there is an overarching influence of the upstream area in terms of land use practices, so what is happening in the buffer strip directly on the river, and in terms of inhabit, um, in stream habitat structures. So the real structures, are there niches, are there niche possibilities or spawning possibilities and so on in the river system itself, and both have positive and negative effects on the local restoration method, which in conclusion means that the upstream restored section is of crucial relevance for the effect on the biota. And particularly in Germany, it doesn't mean that you have to create reference conditions for the next 10 kilometers. It just means just even a moderate score has positive effects for a restored <laughs> site downstream. And it also doesn't mean that you need to have 100% of deciduous forests. In our analysis, it came out that 20% or more deciduous forest in this buffer strip directly on the river has positive effects. So I think this is a good sign, at least for politicians, that not everything needs to be stopped directly in the, at, the, at the river, but there could be some <coughs> positive effect, effects even if it's a little bit lower, so 20, 40%. And high percentages of arable, arable land showed a really negative effect on the fish community, for ex particularly. And conclusions from this are hydromorphological site-specific restoration measures do not guarantee any improve, an improvement of the ecological quality class. So what you do here and a site here does not guarantee you that you get a high good ecological status. This came out, it could be, but it depends also on other, on other pressures or particularly other influences. And the river habitat structure and the land use in the corridors upstream is, has a bigger influence than the whole catchment, which is also important that you don't need to restore the full catchment, but only can look a few kilometers upstream and see if you have the potential and see what the potential is there for a site to get into a good ecological status. And the more natural the land use and habit structure upstream is, the higher is the chance of a good ecological quality. This, I think, is obvious, but okay. <laughs> and the last thing is we think money should be spent wisely, more on corridor improvement than on reach brilliance. So you shouldn't put one million euro in 500 meters, but probably it's better to put them in, in five kilometers. So in, to work really hard with heavy machinery on, on a short, short stretch. Um, all this work was done also in reform in the last year. Many of the uh, analysis were done there, but also in other projects. So I have to thank these ones and you for the attention.